All right. Well, hello and welcome to the first candidate summit um, presentation. We are so excited to have y'all here today. Um, we so I'm going to be doing double duty as folks are just popping in. Um, I'm probably going to give it like one more minute just to make sure that we um, have folks. We had about like 30 folks um, register for um, the summit today. And then we're also recording this. So it is going to go up um, on YouTube. Um, but hello from Rochester, New York. It is a very windy day here. I don't really appreciate it with all of my curls, but that is okay. Um, my name is Mary Catherine Woodson. I'm an assistant director at the university, university, I'm about to do an old title at Rochester Institute for Technology. Um, I am one of the folks that sit on the housing. Oh my gosh, is it Wendy there too in Pittsburgh? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm glad it's not just me because I was just like, y'all, I did not wash my hair for this today. Um, we, I am one of the people that sit on the um, housing internship committee. Um, I am one of the candidate um, communication chairs. Um, and so I am so excited to be with y'all here today. Um, so the topic that we're going to talk about today um, is supervision. And so this is the first of our three. Um, I'm really excited to do this presentation for y'all. This is actually a presentation that I did for the business ops meeting in October. October. Um, this is a presentation that I put together um, after attending um, ACE, our annual conference, um, about two years ago, um, and really focusing on what does it mean to be a supervisor and how do I as a Black woman want to be supervised. So let's jump in. Please feel free to use the chat um, answering questions. Um, I am happy to engage back and forth with y'all. Um, I love conversation. And so um, I am also happy to just talk at the camera. But if y'all have questions, things that you're thinking about, please let me know. Um, I also want to let you know that we do have the live transcript. Um, and that is active. And so if you would like to turn on uh, the closed captionings, that is available for you. All right, supervising while white and what we need from you. Like I said, my name is Mary Catherine Woodson. I'm an assistant director from RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. So let's talk about this. So um, I need people to know that I um, formulated this presentation with target audiences of white supervisors, right? That is what I had in mind. It is my most, um, my blackness is my most prominent identity. Um, and it really shapes and informs so many different decisions and approaches that I have. My hypothesis, however, is that you can take um, these um, strategies that I'm about to give you and apply it to other places um, that would also be relevant in terms of you being a supervisor um, with a dominant per, um, with a dominant identity. So, for instance, um, thinking about um, sexuality or thinking about gender, um, thinking something that we don't talk often enough about for me personally, um, classism, right? What are the classes that we are coming from and how does that inform our work and how does that inform our supervision? Um, so I want you to be able to critically reflect um, about supervision. I need you to think about your supervision and I need you to think about how you want to supervise and how your social identities are going to connect with that. Do not think that supervision is not gonna happen. Do not think that you are gonna be able to supervise with the absence of your identities. We take our whole people to work and that includes our identities. Um, I want you to be able to recall the five supervisory strategies that I'm going to give you for supporting marginalized communities. Um, and then I want you to be able to think of ways that you can use the five supervisory strategies. So along with vulnerability, I'm going to invite Grace into this space. Um, I am still working from home and my dog is very particular about who walks in front of us. Um, and so along with vulnerability, I'm going to offer Grace into this space. Um, please understand that working in this world is so different. 
So I've done a lot of reflection on my supervision. Um, I think that someone asked me recently, well, how did you become such a great supervisor? It was actually on the um, Akuhawai panel that I was working on, that I was a part of um, not too long ago for the Live On um, Symposium. And my immediate answer was, it was because I had a really, (laughs) a lot of really bad supervisors. That's where I really learned how to supervise. And I literally said, well, I'm going to do the opposite of what they did, right? That's where I really kind of informed a lot of my supervision on. So thinking about weak supervision, thinking about strong supervision, because I'm not absent of strong supervision, I got to see really great examples of that. That is really where I came up with these five strategies. The first strategy is going to be establishing trust. The second strategy is going to be believe them. The third is going to be make space. The fourth is going to be showing up. And the fifth is going to be strength-based evaluation. Um, Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I I already see some people putting things in the comments. I love y'all. Listen, we we have so much work to do, um, and really, y'all are going to be the future of our field. And so, if I can do anything to help set you all off on the correct and um, not correct, that seems a little high and mighty, but on a good path, then then I want to do that. So let's talk about it. One of the things that people um, really want to talk to me about a lot is. How do I establish trust with those marginalized communities that are so different than I? And I, as a Black person, I tell people, you got to establish yourself as a credible resource. And what does that mean? Um, It means that you need to demonstrate to me that these are things that you are actively working on, not just at work, but at home and in your personal life and all of those interpersonal interactions. Um, If I do not see a demonstrated credibility, I'm not gonna trust that you have my best interest in mind. What does demonstrated credibility look like? It looks like, what are you watching? America, to me, it was a great um, docu-series about actually where I'm from, um, Chicago, Illinois. It's actually about a suburb called Oak Park. Um, It's about a school system that's really divided um, racially down the middle. Um, My cousins actually went to this school. My cousin was actually in this school while this was being filmed, um, and it really hit home for me. I went up to my supervisor and I said, hey, you should watch this. And she's like, I will. I asked again. I was like, hey, have you watched it? She's like, not yet, not yet, not yet. How do you think that makes me feel? right? This is a really simple thing for you to do to show up for me that you are interested in trying to understand where I'm coming from. Little simple things like that can mean so much to someone. Black Panther, when we talk about and think about superheroes, how often do we see superheroes that don't look anything different than a white man, right? Um, We know that Black Panther was so pivotal for the Black community because we're finally getting to see someone win who's not a bad guy and who looks like us actually being in the front and center as someone who is being, you know, the good guy. How how, how crazy is that concept, right? What are you saying? So thinking and what are you engaging in? Um, One of the things that I absolutely love is um, telling people that podcasts are so great. Um, Code Switch is one of my absolute favorite podcasts. If you are into NPR podcasting, I highly recommend that podcast. It is amazing. Still Processing is another one of my absolute favorite podcasts. Oh, I see the head nods. I love it, y'all. Like those podcasts are so good um, and definitely are going to be great ways for you to continue to do this work on your own and separate from asking people to teach you. What are you reading? Um, why are all the Black kids sitting together at, in the cafeteria? I absolutely love um, that book from Dr. Tatum. I got to see um, Dr. Tatum speak at um, the Academic Initiatives Conference years ago, and it was just absolutely amazing. Tanahashi Coates, Between the World and Me, um, absolutely love it. What are you reading? How are you doing your own work to get there? What questions are you asking? Are you asking the correct questions or are you just in turn microaggressing people, right? Um, Backing your people up. Now, listen, 
MK is not telling you that, you know, when we clearly see people doing some ethical and immoral things that we need to go to bathroom. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when someone you supervise um, from a marginalized community tells you that something is really weighing on them, believe them and back them up. Believe them and back them up. Is this the time that you need to be adamant about bulletin boards getting done on time when literally a black man has just been killed in the street. Is this really the time that that deadline matters? Probably not, right? How are you showing support? How are you showing compassion? Who do you have in your toolbox? This is a concept that I love. Um, I love to tell people that I cannot be the end all be all resource on every single topic in the entire world when it comes to social justice, even when it comes to the black community and the black experience. You need to build up the people in your toolbox that you can call upon at a moment's notice to help you further understand a concept that you're not familiar with. So if you do not identify as queer, who is that person that is in your toolbox that is a confidant that you can ask these questions to so you can better understand? Who is a trans person that you keep near and dear to your heart so that you can better understand how you're using inclusive language? And so on and so on and so on. I don't need you to be the expert on everything. I do need you to be resourceful in understanding that the people that you keep around you speak volumes to everyone else who wants to follow you. We talked about believe them. Believe that your experience is not the only lived experience that exists, um, that there are groups in this country that are intentionally being targeted every single day, that every space that you walk into, that you create, that you support, may not feel welcome to everyone else that you are trying to invite into that space. And believe that people may feel unsafe on your campus. I know that that is really difficult to think that even though we are trying to create these beautiful campuses that involve and encompass everyone's um, experience, that there is still going to be nothing that we do that is still going to make it feel welcome for everyone. You have to believe that. You have to believe it. Um, I love some of these conversations that are happening in the chat right now. I love this. I love this. I love this. Um, making space. Um, we create barriers all the time, and we really need to recognize what barriers have we created. How do we dismantle the barriers, and what space can we? create. I think one of the things that is so important that we as um, supervisors need to understand is that we need to create spaces that are not necessarily for us that we don't necessarily get to have access to. The Leadership Academy was such a beautiful experience for me, um, being a mid-level professional that got to um, connect with other mid-level professionals of color because in my mind that wasn't even a thing that existed in this field. Um, you have to understand that creating space for people to be vulnerable with other people that they identify with is so important. Um, affinity groups are often this space, um, but also how are you as a supervisor trying to connect people um, that you supervise with other people that share identities that they have? you have to lose this, how do you say, you have to lose this feeling and this sense of ownership that you are the only person that can connect with this person. We, we have to lose that, that territorial feeling. If I'm supervising someone and I realize that they probably connect better with someone else that they have a similar identity with, I want to do that. I want to connect those people so that if for whatever reason that me being a supervisor with my dominant um, social identities is overwhelming to that person, that they have someone that they can go talk to. Um, we have to lose the pride. Pride was the word I was looking for. We have to lose the pride that we feel that we are the only people that can be the resource for the people we supervise because it's just not true. It's just not true.
I need people to understand that we, and I'm speaking specifically about the Black experience right now, we are coming to work every day with trauma. We're coming to work with people literally telling us that our experience doesn't matter and it's not real and that we shouldn't be afraid to leave our house every day. But the truth of the matter is we are. We are. The thing about this slide is that I have had this presentation for about two years. I didn't get to present it because of COVID. Um, and every time I went back to it, I had to keep updating the slide. I had to keep updating it. People who have literally just been taken from this earth for no reason. If you can imagine what it is like having to face the world every day, thinking that you could be the next person. I think about that all the time. What are people going to say about me if I was the person that just disappeared, right? The mental health tax is real, especially for your Black colleagues, especially for the Black students that you are interacting with, especially with your Black supervisees, especially if we're talking about RAs and, and RAs having to be the front lines and the people that are going first to knock on doors and putting them in situations where they may have authority. And the first thing that people want to do is say that they're being targeted, right? The mental health tax is so real. We can do this slide for trans folks. We could do this slide for LGBT folks. We could do this slide for people who live in poverty. We could do this slide for people with disabilities. We can keep recreating this for marginalized identities over and over and over again. We have to believe that the mental health tax is real. Um, again, Black professionals shouldn't be the only professionals meeting with Black students. I think that this is something that is really keen. Um, again, when I originally was presenting this, I was presenting this to senior housing officers, right? Um, I think you all, as the younger generation of this field, start thinking about how can you continue to make sure that your colleagues and potentially your supervisees are not the ones who are being taxed with this work solely? People love to tokenize people with marginalized identities very quickly. Well, Mark's the queer person here, so they should probably meet with the queer student. Or Mark is the only queer RA that I have on staff, so they should probably go try to connect with this queer student. What are we really doing to those people when we're only putting them in those situations, right? It's probably problematic that we feel comfortable with only Mark going to speak to that student and not someone else who could truly be an advocate. I'm gonna invite you to take a deep breath because sometimes this work gets heavy and we need to release some of those emotional flares that we immediately feel. So I invite you to take a deep breath with me in through the nose, out through the mouth, one, two, three. Thank you for that. Let's keep going. Framing strengths frame success. Um, the last thing that I, I beg of you as supervisors is under, under, underhanding, understanding how to frame strengths that people have that may be very prominent because of an identity identity they have rather than trying to frame it within otherness, um, within stereotypes, um, within, uh, frankly, just harmful comments. Um, these are some of the things that has been told to me from my assistant director level all the way down to my RA level. You need to package your communication differently. People love to tell women that they're too assertive and too aggressive. Um, people love to tell Black women that they're bitchy um, and, you know, just rude, right? I need to package my communication differently. 
Um, I've been told that I'm not academic enough. I was told my when I was a grad student that I was not academic enough to be the grad student in the honors college. Um, I, I, to this day, have no idea uh, what that really means um, other than I'm too black. I don't, I don't really know what act too academic means because the honors college only required a 3.2. I graduated undergrad with a 3.59 and I had a 4.0 in grad school. So I'm not really sure what they meant. Um, but I translated that as I'm too black for the honors college, right? Um, that I'm too loud. Oh my God, uh, that was on a uh, legitimate evaluation. Um, not academic enough was on an evaluation from an RA. I was too loud was on an evaluation um, from a supervisor, um, a full-time supervisor. I had an assistant director when I was an RA tell me to straighten my hair before an interview because you know the standard of beauty is only through the eyes of whiteness in this country. So straighten my hair so that my curls would not be distracting for people. I have not straightened my hair in years. Um, I had someone say, remove my identity from my communication. Uh, yeah, I, I'm here to let you know that uh, your identity is ever present in all communication that you have um, and it's not going anywhere. Um, there is no way for me to remove my blackness or remove my womanhood from how I communicate. Um, that same eval where I was called loud, I was also called dramatic. Um, and you can imagine having to confront a supervisor um, to let them know that this is a really offensive thing to call black women um, because it plays into stereotypes. Um, and so you need to reform and reshape your uh, your, your critique so I can better understand what you're looking for because calling me dramatic does nothing. Language matters. Language matters. Um, I have a whole other presentation another time in another place, another space about acid-based um, mindset and what it means when we are trying to frame the work that someone has done positively rather than um, just harping on the negatives. Um, language matters. It matters. Oops, sorry. Um, these strategies are, are simple. They're, they're, they're very simple, right? It's not rocket science. It's not um, asking you to do things that um, require any type of, you know, overbearing financial involvement. Um, what I can tell you is that it's an investment and I pride myself on being a wonderful supervisor. I, I, I say I have no natural talents, but supervision is one of them. It's one of the gifts that I have. Um, and one of the things that sets me apart from other people who supervises is about the investment that I'm putting into my people. I am investing in my people. If you are pouring into the people that you are trying to get to work, they're going to work and they're going to work happily um, and almost for free, but make sure you're compensating people, but, and almost for free, right? Um, pour into your people because it matters. It matters, but it takes time. So here are your five strategies again. Establish trust, believe them, make space, show up, strength-based evaluation. And that's me. Okay, so um, one, ugh, beautiful Mary Catherine. I was talking fast, y'all, which is not a thing that I do. Um, I don't know if people know about um, RIT, but we host um, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. And so I'm actually typically in spaces with interpreters and the interpreters are talking. And so I can't be a motor mouth, um, but I really wanted to give you as much of this presentation as I could. Um, but yeah, so looking at our space, um, I'm gonna actually ask Spencer to break you up into two groups. Um, about five and five, and we have a couple discussion questions that I would love for y'all to talk about. Um, I'm going to put you in there for probably about 12 minutes. I know that's so like random, but that's what I'm thinking. Um, and then we're going to come back. We're going to discuss a little bit what y'all talked about. Um, and then 
let's see if anyone has any questions um, or any reactions that they want to discuss with the larger group. So Spencer, behind the scenes. Working on two five. And the breakout rooms are going to be actually smaller. We might actually just stay because we're losing folks and it's totally fine. Honestly, we're actually going to stay. So I'm just going to drop the questions in here. Um, and y'all can take a second to just think about it. Um, and then we can just come back here. So sorry. It was, I don't know why nine to five was in my head. Um, we can just come back here um, in like one minute and then let's just discuss that a little bit. And if anyone has any reactions or questions that they like to ask, happy to answer as best I can. So let's take a minute and um, let's just reflect on those questions. I know for me, for the first question, how do you ensure you're doing no good or no harm Ooh, as a supervisor? Um, <laughs> <laughs> whoops. Um, um, listening is is huge. Um, mm -hmm. And just being there to support um, through just hearing the story, hearing, you know, the experience um, so that they know, you know, that person knows that I am listening and and um, and internalizing what they're what they're saying. I think one of the things that is really important, um, and so thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. I think one of the things that is really important is that we have to acknowledge as supervisors, we're always going to do harm. We're always going to do harm. Um, and for me, it's always about how can I do the least amount of harm as possible? What does my harm reduction plan look like? And I think listening is a great first step, um, which is hard, y'all. It's so hard. Um, I am a pretty proactive person and, and problem solving forward person. Um, and sometimes all people need is just to talk it out and not you have to respond. And so are we listening to respond or are we listening to understand? Right. Um, and that's so hard. That's so hard as a supervisor sometimes, but it's what we have to do. Other thoughts on harm reduction? Kind of along that same vein, or in that same vein, if some if I have an RA coming to me with like a really intense situation, or they just want to talk something out, before I jump to like, because I'm always like, I want to give advice, or like try to offer what I can because of my experiences or something, I'm always like, wait a minute, Emily, you need to check yourself, and you need to ask them, and that's what I try to start doing in like all of my meetings is do you want me to just listen or do you want me to be actively trying to help you solve a problem? Or, you know, if I'm sharing this experience with you, if I've shared an experience similar to you, do you want me to talk about that? If not, that's fine. Because sometimes people are comforted by, like, oh, you've shared this experience. Let's both talk about it. So I always try to check myself and it's it takes practice because I think as helpers, we want to be like, let's solve the problem. <laughs> like, let's help. But like you said, MK, like it's not... It's not always about that. Thanks, Emily. I think one of one of the things that I really also love about that practice about what do you want from me is it kind of gets at we're asking people how they want to be supported. Um, one of the things that um, oh us housing folk really struggle sometimes with boundaries. Um, I'm going to call us, uh, I'm going to call it what it is. We struggle with boundaries. I think you absolutely touch on the, we're, we're the helpers. We want to fix problems and we want to figure out how can I help these people be the best they can be. Um, one of the things that really helps us establish boundaries, both in our professional life, as well as our personal life. Because I started to do this as well, especially when I noticed that I'm not having the best day um, and someone wants to take something from me um, and they start to tell me their story. And before I go anywhere, I go, how would you like me to respond? Would you like advice? Do you want me to rage with you? Um, or are you looking for something else, right? We are asking people how they want to be um, supported because especially when, <laughs> listen, y'all, there, there are going to be times where, um, 
people want you to just rage with them and you don't necessarily agree with why they want us to rage. Um, and that is when asking how they want to be supported comes in handy. Um, because if they, if you don't agree with what they're necessarily raging with, you're like, how do you want me to respond? Um, and they're like, I want you to respond <laughs> with rage. I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, no, that sucks. That's awful. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then they go, well, how would you respond if I asked for like advice? I'm like, mm, maybe it's you and not the other person. I would just think about it. Maybe we should be reflecting on what we did here. Right. Um, and so that's what I absolutely love about. We need to be asking people how they want to be supported um, because sometimes we're going to absolutely hit them, miss the mark. Um, and people get frustrated with us, but they were coming to us to ask for help anyway. Um, it really, it, listen, we gotta, we gotta put the frames up. We gotta put the frames up. It helps us so much. What does investing in supervisee look like? What does that look like? Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Allie, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Um, for me, investing in my supervisees looks like creating intentional personal relationships with them. Um, so I take a lot of time to get to know who you are as a person, because, I mean, like you were saying this entire time, you know, our identities impact how we navigate the world. and that impacts how we do our work. So um, I take a lot of time to get to know like who they are as people. And then I do spend a lot of time uh, just learning about like what their goals and ambitions are. And that way I could try to set up opportunities or like moments where we can learn and develop together to get them to a point where they feel like they can be successful or they feel ready for like the next step or whatever that looks like for them. One of the things that I absolutely love about that, and if y'all don't mind, if you all are currently in a supervisory um, position, could you let me know how many you're supervising in the chat? Um, so if you're talking about your regular assignment for the full year or your summer assignment, just let me know how many people you're supervising. Um, it takes so much intentionality to supervise people. Um, we have to understand that folks need different things. And us trying to do blanket supervision is not, is not going to work. Um, we cannot supervise one person to the next the same way. We can have the same goals. We can have the same um, expectations. Um, and our hope is that the end result is going to be similar. Um, but we can't supervise people the same way. In education, I don't know if I have any ed degrees in here, but we called it um, differentiated instruction. I believe that supervision is the exact same way, meaning that we have 10 kids in a classroom. Each one of them is at a different reading level. Why are we giving them all the same materials and expecting them to read at the same um, level, right? That it's, 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 it's impossible and it's, um, it's frankly rude. <laughs> Um, you know, I, we, we can't teach, we shouldn't be evaluating, um, you know, a fish, how well it climbs a tree. And so really we need to make sure that we absolutely have, um, the time and energy, um, to supervise. So I see 15, eight, um, seven, 15. So y'all, y'all, I'm only going to be on my soapbox once during this whole time and it's being recorded so people are going to hear me when I say this I need y'all to understand that in order to sustain this energy that you have to invest in these folks and do this well you cannot be in these positions forever you can't be in these positions forever you are not going to do our students a service I recognize that there is a lot of rhetoric about the toxicity of residence life and housing, about the demand that we're doing, about, you know, I, I have heard all of it. Um, I have lived much of it. Um, I am 
I am begging y'all to understand that this job that you're in right here moves very quickly. And we, we need to make sure that we are retaining you all and moving you up through the field um, or out into the division. Um, the reason I knew that I was ready to move up after four years of being an RD was because I realized how exhausted I was from being a supervisor and how exhausting students were making me. I was like, I do this really well, but I'm exhausted. I'm like, you know, thinking about some really not happy thoughts about these students right now. What is this? And then I realized I was like, oh, it's time for me to move on, right? Listen to your body, right? Listen to your body because this is another part of harm reduction um, and, and thinking about investing into people as they are continuing um, in our spaces. When you're tired, you are tired and you are not going to enjoy this work. You are not going to do this work well and you are going to be pissed off at everyone. I know I did it. I know I did it. I was like, oh my God, if I see another RA, I'm going to scream. I had 16 for two years and then 14 for two years. Um, and I was done. And now I supervise five people who are all master's level professionals. And it is so different. It is so different. Um, professionals need very different things. I totally was supervising a grad all four years. I keep forgetting that I did that. Um, professionals need something so different than students need. Um, but I, I want you to know that for your health and for your, um, oh my gosh, 7 a.m. Okay, bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so early. Um, but um, for your mental health, I need you to make sure you are listening to your body and listening to the cues. The money and the benefits are not that good in this work. Um, please do not be staying around. You need to choose your happiness. You need to choose your joy um, and staying in this work because you know you get a free apartment and a meal plan. It's not worth it. And you're doing yourself and those students a disservice. Um, so that's my soapbox. I'm done. I'm getting off of it. I'm off. I just want y'all to think about you, think about the students. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then my last question is, is what does, um, what does successful supervision look like? What does that look like? I think about some of, some of the best supervision that I have ever had was based on one, someone who shared an identity with me. And I know that that's not always the case, but um, when I tell you it's so important that we are retaining um, our folks with marginalized identities um, in this work, it is so important because there are so many students that don't see themselves reflected in the people who are working. Um, one, someone who, um, really um, made their expectations clear to me um, and their support of me was never absent, even though I made a mistake. Um, one of the best things that we can do for our people is um, making space for them to mess up and us not reacting like it's the end of the world, right? We can teach folks about administration. We can teach folks about deadlines. We can teach folks about organization. Um, and obviously there are those folks that struggle with that nonstop and we need to hold them accountable. Um, but one of the things I have realized is that people are so afraid to make mistakes and they're so afraid that it's going to be the end of the world. And as soon as we realized that, um, as soon as I realized that I could make a mistake um, and she wasn't going to hate me and um, there isn't moral value attached to making mistakes, um, I, I, was, I was free. I was free to be a professional and move forward. Um, I see in the chat. 
Ooh, child, feedback without the fear of my reaction. I'm still not great at it. I, but see, mm, I'm going to call myself out on what I just said. I am not great at receiving feedback, but I can tell you exactly what the feedback is going to be. So um, I think that is a beautiful, beautiful thing that if you can practice um, in your mind, which you know someone's going to say um, for feedback about you, um, that punch and that sting of feedback um, gets better. I think the other thing that I want y'all to practice um, is when you are in a one-on-one, one of the last things that I want you to practice saying is, do you have any feedback for me? And then wait, right? It's literally, so Allie, do you have any feedback for me? And you just wait. And more than likely, the answer is going to be no. But here's the thing. Um, if something happens later on um, and, you know, you are going to get accused of so many things as a supervisor, it's just inevitable. You're going to be accused of different things. One of the things that I love for people to understand is um, I ask you every time we are face-to-face, what do you need from me? What feedback do you have? And so knowing that feedback does not wait until your evaluation. You should be seeking that feedback out um, all year long. I think the next step in receiving feedback is trying not to explain it away. Um, It is, and y'all, I'm not good at it. Literally my evaluations next week, y'all can ask my supervisor. I am not good at it. I was like, oh, I have a reason why I did this. Oh, I have a reason why I did this too. It's so difficult. It's like apologizing, right? We want to explain away why we did something, but part of feedback is being able to absorb it, chew on it, and then figuring out what we can do so that we are manipulating that for us to be better. Um, Yeah, the lesson, absolutely. When we're creating space for feedback, it lessens the pain that you might feel. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other thoughts on successful supervision? And I will also offer any thoughts or reactions from anything that I've said today, anything that you're kind of lingering on. All right. Well, seeing none, thank you all for being here today and for being engaged. I hope that your summers are beautiful and not as, nope, but still windy. I'm not going outside. My curls need to last a week. Um, So I hope y'all are having wonderful days um, all over. Um, My contact, ooh, I will throw my contact information in the chat. just a heads up, I am going on vacation. And when I tell y'all that I am turning all of my notifications off, I'm turning all of my notifications off. So please know that I will get back to you. Um, and then I hope to see y'all um, for our, <laughs> thank you. I have not seen my family in over a year because of COVID and I am going back uh, to Chicago for the first time this weekend. So I am excited to finally see, uh, my family. Um, there is my contact information. Um, like I said, I will be on vacation, um, but I will get back to you. We hope to see you all for our next, um, uh, our next summit, um, we're going to be talking about the topic of mentorship, um, both seeking out mentorship, um, and peer mentorship. Um, I think mentorship is an area that we, um, we, uh, we tell a lot of people like, you need to find your mentor, you need to talk to your mentor. But a lot of people are like, I don't, I don't know who that is. Um, And so we're definitely going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about how to seek out other forms of mentorship, not just people who are, um, 
ahead of you. So um, thank you all. Again, my contact information is in the chat um, and I will hang around if anyone wants to talk, but other than that, have a great day. Thank you.